In this video, we're going to give an overview of one of the three parts of the exposure triangle. Today's episode is about aperture. And by understanding aperture and the other two parts of the exposure triangle and how they work together, we're going to be able to use that knowledge and the science behind it to get the results we want and get our pictures looking the way we want them. So stay tuned. Hey fellow photographers, what did you shoot today? And maybe a more interesting question might be, why did you choose to shoot what you shot with the gear that you used to shoot it with? Hmm. So what is aperture? Aperture is just a hole or an opening that light travels through. Wait, really? That, that's all there is to it? Okay, wait, I know it sounds simple, but this basic aspect actually has such an impact on the aesthetics of our photos that it's worth actually taking a few episodes to go over all the intricacies and a deeper dive into what makes this so special. Before we get started, we should address a few things and we really need to start thinking about how photographers look at light. Photographers look at light in, in sort of quantities and these quantities are differentiated by either an action of doubling the amount of light available to the camera or sensor or cutting it in half. And each one of these movements in either direction is known as a stop. So a stop is either a doubling of light or cutting the amount of light in half that the camera sees. So you've probably heard other photographers throw around words like, oh, stop the lens down, or you know, open up the lens a few stops. Well, when they're talking about stops of light in that sense, they're usually regarding to opening or closing of the aperture, or the size of the hole that light gets through. And that's what we're gonna be discussing today. But it's important to realize that we're talking a language of stops, and I'm gonna try and explain briefly what that is right now. So how do we get double or half the amount of light when it comes to an opening? Well, it's kind of easy to think about. Let's think of our opening as a circle, like this. And let's say it has a radius of, let's say, two arbitrary units, right? Well, if we want more light to go through a hole, we have to make the hole bigger. But we can't just double the, the radius of the, of the circle. We have to make the area of the circle, the surface area, larger by a factor of two. So what we want is a circle that has twice the area. So the area of a circle, pi r squared, for a radius of two, is going to be, in this case, 4 pi, right? Because it's 2 squared times pi. So if we want a circle with an area of 8 pi, which would be twice as much as this circle, what, kind of what size radius would we need? Well, we can work backwards, and it turns out that the radius we need here is going to be 2 times the square root of 2. Okay, so that's twice as much light getting through because the hole is twice as big. The area of the circle is twice as big. What if we want half as much light to get through? Well, we need, an, we need a circle with an area that is half the size of this original circle. So if we want half the area here, we, have an area of, we want an area of 2 pi. Well, we can work backwards again to get our radius here is actually going to be 2 over the square root of 2. So you have to notice something interesting. And it, and it happens all the, you know, this is, this is true for any doubling or halving of light. When we're going this direction, right, when we're going this way, and even when we're going from here to here, when we're decreasing the amount of light, we're reducing the area of this aperture, of this, of this circle that light is coming through, by a factor of the square root of 2. So what we're doing is we're, in this case, we're dividing by the square root of 2, and we're dividing by the square root of 2. Now when we're going the other way, right, when we're going this way, we want more light you know, we made the hole bigger and bigger, we're multiplying by a square root of two. And the square root of two is probably the most important mathematical number in all of photography. The inverse square law is based off the power of two, aperture settings are based off the power of two, everything is based off of this number. So just keep this in mind and you're gonna see where this comes into play with aperture a little bit later. So how do lenses and optics use diaphragms or apertures to sort of open and close to let more or less light in? Well, in the very beginning, the very early rudimentary lenses, like this Petzval lens that we talked about was from the 1800s, they used what they called waterhouse stops. So they actually had different sized circles that they would slide into the lens to make the opening a certain size. So if you wanted, you know, something, a large aperture, a large opening, you'd use something like this. And then, they, you know, you would go down and if you wanted a small opening, something very, very tiny. You would, you would stick that into the lens like so. And this is how you would control the amount of light that would go in and, you know, that would go into the lens. 
and into the camera. And then things got a little bit more sophisticated. So some lenses, even modern lenses like this lens here, they have a manual aperture ring on the edge of the lens. And when you rotate this ring, the aperture blades start to converge and they make a smaller and smaller hole, just like this. Or maybe you can see better on this big giant lens like this. So this has sort of a, that has clicking stops. I don't know if you heard the clicking. This is kind of a smooth transition with the hole there. So this is, you know, what the next series of lenses had, sort of this built-in diaphragm, instead of using the stops that you would have to pull in and out every time. And then, of course, modern lenses just have a sort of an automatic aperture. And what happens here is that right before the picture is taken, the lens will actually just quickly sort of stop down, and uh, you don't even hear it, you know? It's just, it just right before you take the picture, a split second before, the lens closes to the aperture that you've selected, and then boom, the picture is taken, and then it reverts back. And that's especially important in something like this, like a DSLR, because what's happening is, we haven't talked about types of cameras yet, but what happens is you're looking through a pentaprism mirror and a, another mirror down here. So you're, what you see through the viewfinder is actually looking through the lens. And remember, if this hole is smaller, you're letting in less light. So you're gonna not be able to see as much through the viewfinder if the lens is stopped down while you're trying to take the picture and compose the picture. So what happens is that the lens is usually full open, letting as much light in, as possible in. And then right before you take the picture, boom, it stops down, letting the amount of light that you want in and then takes the picture. So how can we compare two different lenses? Like let's take these two lenses that I had up before. This lens is huge, it's, 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 it's massive. I mean, this, this lens is, you know, the glass in this lens is bigger than this entire lens itself, right? So this must have a really big aperture. It must have, you know, a, it lets, lets a lot of light in. And that is true to an extent because we have to think about it this way. This lens is a process lens and it's designed to be on a pretty big camera. And while it does, yes, it does let a lot of light in because the diameter of this opening is very large compared to this one. Where this lens is positioned, you know, how far away from the film plane or the sensor is going to affect how much light it's actually letting through because due to the inverse square law of light, light gets less and less intense the further and further away it gets from the source. So let's say that the light is coming through this lens, you know, by the time it gets all the way back here, the light is very, very diminished. So even though this is letting a lot of light in at the beginning, depending on where this is placed in relation to the focal plane, and if you, look at, if you look here, this is a 480 millimeter lens. So this is about, uh, I would say like one and a half feet, maybe 19 inches. And so that is where this is focusing. Whereas this lens here is designed to go on a, uh, like a thread mount body. And I'm not sure what the flange distance is, but it's a lot shorter than, you know, 480 millimeters. So this lens, even though the hole is smaller, it's mounted way back here, you know, close to the film plane. So the amount of distance that the light has to travel before it hits the film plane is very small, so that light will still be very intense. And this is kind of the problem, right? We can't just look at the big, fancy, giant piece of glass on the front of the lens and say, oh, that's gonna be, have a huge aperture, and you know, I'm gonna let a lot of light in. You have to take into account the focal length of the lens. And that's why we developed this nomenclature we call F number. So the F number of a lens is a way that we normalize, you know, normalize the uh, size of the diaphragm or the aperture based on the focal length of the lens. And it's a really simple equation. So the F number, and you've probably seen, you know, a lot of lenses are, all lenses are pretty much designated with an F number. So the F number, which we denote N, big N. And you're gonna see it on your camera as sort of like F slash, and then you're gonna have some sort of number here. I'm not gonna use this nomenclature in the equations because we're also gonna use focal length, which is also F, so it's gonna get confusing. But N is the F number, and that is going to be equal to the focal length of the lens divided by the diameter of the opening. So now we have normalized for the focal length some sort of measure of how much light is getting through based on that lens and the camera that it's designed for. Okay, so we have our expression for F number here. Now, F numbers aren't gonna take arbitrary values, right? Because we wanna sort of standardize things and, and get a feel for things across lenses. So when we switch lenses or switch equipment, you know, it's, we, we can go from equipment to other piece of equipment and not have to relearn everything. 
So we're not going to see, you know, F numbers like 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, you know, sequentially like that. They're actually going to follow a geometric sequence. Now, the sequence you're mostly familiar with is going to be something like this. So you're going to see, you know, F 1.4 or 2 or 2.8 or 4 or 5.6 or 8 or 11, 16, and so on and so forth. And this is where the square root of 2 comes into play again. So remember that I said the square root of 2 is the most important sort of number in photography. And if you notice, these actually follow, these F numbers actually follow a geometric sequence. So 1.4 is roughly equivalent to the square root of 2 to the first power. So the square root of 2 is 1.4142, but we usually just, we, we truncate it at maybe one decimal place. Right? So 2 is, is simply the square root of 2 squared. Right? Square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. So this is 2.0. So then we hit go to root 2 cubed and root 2 to the fourth and root 2 to the fifth, root 2 to the sixth, so on and so forth. So it follows a geometric sequence. So what are these f numbers telling us? Well, as the f number gets bigger, and this is a little counterintuitive, but as the f number gets bigger, we're actually having the amount of light that gets through. So now we are talking in stops again. So each one of these, the movement between here and here, and here and here, and here and here, right? Each movement, each step in this sequence represents a halving of the light. Each is spaced one stop apart. So because of that, now we have an idea. Now we can compare these lenses. And you're like, well, wait, I don't, you know, I have a lens and I don't see, I don't see the number on there. Uh, I have the, the Canon 50 millimeter f1.8. I don't see that on the, on the list. Well, 1.8 is going to fall somewhere in here, right? So if we have f1.8, that equates to square root of 2 times 1 and 2 thirds, or, you know, 5 thirds, however you want to look at it. So this is actually, f1.8 is one-third stop brighter than an f2 lens, or a lens shot at f2, and it's two-thirds of a stop darker than the f1.4 lens. So you can break these down into half stops, into third stops, and you'll see this throughout. And your digital cameras usually have intermittent stops, and you can even usually choose, do you want half stops, third stops, some cameras might even do quarter stops. So you can get a very fine-tuned, precise amount of light coming through your camera based on the aperture. So if your lens has a number on here that's not on here, like for example, this is, this is a f, you can see this 1 colon 9. So this is, this is an f9 lens. Uh, so 9 is actually right here, it's going to be square root of 2 to the 6 and 1 third. So it's 1 third stop less bright than 8, and it's two-thirds of a stop brighter than an f11 lens. So just remember that everything here is expressed as a power of 2. It goes in a sequence, and the f numbers you know, follow different stops. So now we can compare light that's coming into a lens because it's now independent of the focal length. We've normalized for the focal length of the lens. And now we can start talking about different ways that we can use this to create the pictures we want. Okay, so this is kind of an introduction to stops, F numbers, and aperture, and it doesn't really seem like a big deal at this point because, okay, we're just, you know, opening and closing a hole to let in more or less light to a scene so we can get something that's properly exposed. So, I mean, what's the big deal? It's not really, there's nothing really going on. But there's a secondary consequence of aperture that is extremely important, and it has to do with depth of field. And that's what we're going to talk about next week, because I think we're going to have to dedicate an entire episode to it. And we're going to go into the math and show you the equations as to why depth of field the way, is the way it is. So remember, when we talked about the pinhole cameras, we had near infinite depth of field because we had such a small opening. So the smaller the opening, the higher the, you know, the, higher the F number, the more depth of field we get. Almost everything is in focus. And remember from the pinhole videos, that's because points of light are being projected to in an equal size point on the other side of the, the, the sensor or the film plane. But here, 
when we're, when we're wide open, when we have these big lenses like this and we have lots of light coming through, remember that the light coming straight in, the light coming from oblique angles and from the side, all this light is coming in and it's being focused, right? But we get light from all over the place. So only the light that is actually going to hit the focal plane, perfectly in focus, is gonna be in focus. Everything on either side of that is gonna be blurry. So when we have uh, small F numbers, large apertures, wide open lenses, we get a very shallow depth of field. So this is extremely important to understand and we're gonna spend next week going into a lot of math as to why it is the way that it is. We're gonna bring back the lens diagrams. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a party, let me tell you. But it's so important to know that and once you know those equations and you kind of, even if you don't you know, know how to use them, if you just understand what they're telling you, you're gonna know what kind of lens you need to get the looks you want. You're gonna know what lenses work best in which situations why wide angle lenses have you know, very uh, big depth of field and you know, why portrait lenses are the way they are and, and why people sort of chase the bigger glass for subject isolation. So please uh, subscribe to this channel, you know, turn on the notification bell for next week so you, you get that video right when it comes out and that's gonna be the key. So this was just an introduction and I really hope you stay tuned till next week because we're really gonna dive in and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So until then, as always, happy shooting.